How many of you believe that society is moving at a sufficient pace on the climate crisis and on the ESG agenda? Raise of hands. Sufficient. I see a few hands. For the virtual audience, maybe 2% of the room has raised their hands. How many of you believe that your business is moving at a sufficient pace on the climate crisis and the ESG agenda? We've gone down to zero <laughs> point, not percent. Well, so the four leaders to my left represent businesses that are accelerating this agenda. And they're going to have a chance to elaborate a little bit more than I let you all. Now, I think what's important is that they are representing solutions that are scaling the uh, effort against climate change and also other aspects of ESG. And so in the next 28 minutes, we're going to talk to these essential players and understand how are they accelerating the agenda through the lenses of technology and collaboration. Kuntoni, let's start with the money. <laughs> now, net zero requires significant, massive technology deployment we've never seen before. That requires finance. How do we accelerate capital flows? Yes, this is a very important issue. Uh, that's why the target also need to be sent on both a medium term and longer term basis for the carbon neutrality as well as the net zero. Uh, the capital expenditure uh, need to be planned well, especially with new investment that will be taking place and how to adopt the sustainability and the uh, green concept uh, into this part. Yes, we work with many customers uh, to help them make the transformation and the transition to uh, these major uh, requirements. Uh, uh, for instance, we work with many uh, customers on uh, the renewable energy projects, whether uh, wind or solar uh, across the region, um, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in China, for instance, or even in Japan. And also, we work with many of the companies that are making the transition to uh, reduce the carbon emission and also uh, reduce uh, different types of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, for example, in the installation of the solar panel for the manufacturing facilities uh, for energy saving. So these are challenges that we are providing and working with our customers uh, accordingly. And could you tell us when did the shift toward renewables begin for the bank? You've been doing it for quite some time. And today, maybe what, what portion of the energy portfolio do renewables take up? I think the first part start with the government side. I think some over 10, 15 years ago, uh, the government started with the consideration of the diversification of the energy sources, which I think uh, previously mostly on the fossil base. We have some hydro uh, power, but uh, mostly in the coal, lignite, or the uh, f uh, fossil base. So. Over the next, over the last 10, 15 years, government have been planned uh, systematically uh, on the renewable energy uh, with the solar energy, uh, then later on with the wind, and initially with significant uh, support, uh, financial support, tax support in order to make the project moving forward. But as time goes on, the expertise uh, move forward, and together with the production cost that has come down quite significantly and become quite, quite, quite uh, comparable to other sources, and actually in some sense also somewhat cheaper, uh, in many sense nowadays. So we work with uh, those customers uh, along that basis, uh, both in terms of the commercial loans and later on also access to the capital market through the green bond, sustainable bond, and also sustainability, sustainability link bonds, which also have certain targets uh, for the corporates to achieve and I, I haven't looked on Bloomberg just this moment, but uh, I know in the past you have been a, a leader of the market share for green bonds. Does that stand very true in Thailand today? Yeah, I think uh, about 70% of the bond issuance uh, on the green bond and the sustainable bonds, uh, we have always been uh, a lead uh, underwriter in that process. Mm -hmm. 
Manish, we, we heard Kuntoni speak a little bit about uh, renewable energy. Um, there's, there's a whole lot to the energy system supply side, demand side. And Schneider Electric brings a whole lot of different technology solutions to market critical for decarbonizing. Could you tell us what you are particularly most excited about? Sure, um, and, and thank you. Great to be here. We'll follow the money. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say, yes, at Schneider Electric, we are the digital partner for sustainability and efficiency. Uh, you know, today, 80% uh, uh, of uh, the problem of carbon is linked to energy. And uh, what we say at, uh, that 70% uh, of this problem uh, can be resolved today. I think this has been the theme of this morning that we need to move fast and there are solutions which have been existing today. Uh, if you, the equation uh, is simple uh, or if I oversimplify it, it is electrification plus digitization is equal to sustainability. And why? Because you know, electrification is the best vector of decarbonization because it can be renewable, it could be uh, stored, you could work with microgrids, it could be decentralized, it could be coming close. Uh, and then you have uh, digital, which is the best vector for efficiency. Uh, and I say that because digital is making energy visible. So today you have connectivity from plant to plug uh, across the full flow of energy that was not possible. Now, thanks to COVID, we've had, uh, and you know, we have seen the acceleration of digitization. We have episode one of internet, which is about connecting people to people. Now, we have to go faster on the episode two, which is connecting machines to machines and machines to people. Uh, and, and, and together with this, we are able to, to drive much more sustainability. Now, if I, if I go to the next step, you know, this. 70% of the solution exists from technologies today. And, and we say that because uh, you, know, there, you can look at the demand side as well as the supply side. On the demand side, uh, which is more pressing and something that we can address today and, and thanks to you know, financing which is available, uh, first is about energy efficiency. We need to drive much more energy efficiency which can solve uh, according to our studies, uh, almost 25% of the problem. Then it is electrification. I mean, we, we, we heard from, uh, from Nissan this morning, electric vehicles are uh, more efficient. Uh, and you know, uh, electric, electrical energy is much more efficient than any other form of, uh, of energy. Uh, you know, you can feed in an electric vehicle directly to the, to the wheels of the car, the energy, so you're not wasting, you know, in, in very simplistic terms. The, th the same about process electrification. So electrification can resolve almost 30% of the problem. Electricity is, uh, you know, today as it's roughly, and I think I quote uh, Bloomberg here, uh, around 20% of uh, the primary energy is, is electrical. Uh, that is going to almost triple uh, in, in the coming three decades. So electrification is the other uh, solution that we have. And finally, we have the supply side, which is other 45%, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, decentralized. You need to make sure that you're ready for that bi-directional flow of energy uh, through, uh, through microgrids, through storage, through electric vehicles, feeding back into the grid, et cetera. And, and you know, this is what is going to solve uh, today those issues and you know 2030 is around the corner where we are we are committed to reducing by 50 percent and if you don't meet 2030 I think 2050 is far away so you know this combination of electrical and digital and uh, I think there's no energy transition possible without the digital transition and I and, and the two go together Kunpanot uh, it was farmland and then it was a radio station, <laughs> and now it's the most expensive mixed-use development in all of Thailand. <laughs> Tell us about One Bangkok, and why should we be excited about it after this video? And I'm sure it links to a few of the things that, that Manish has talked about. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bloomberg. I think the, the important part of what we do is to think a lot about sustainability. And you know, at Fraser's property, we, we know real estate make a big impact to carbon emissions. We 
contribute to 40% of globally of carbon emissions in, in the real estate sector. And if you talk about city development, uh, we are account for 70% of the carbon emission. So sustainability and carbon neutral objective is very important to our strategy. Um, the knowledge that we, we built over since uh, the first initiative of uh, sustainability uh, and green development started in 2006. Uh, we have evolved and it takes time because you know, real estate cannot be changed overnight. Uh, and as mentioned of, of many of the discussion today, we talk about if this is going to work, it's because of collaboration, because of like-minded uh, you know, approach. And um, together, the most important part is technology as well. Uh, definitely, uh, the partnership with, with Schindler is, uh, is definitely the, the journey as well to us. So at uh, One Bangkok, it's, it's a collective uh, experience and knowledge as well that we did across different parts of the world. Uh, and many of initiatives, even Brownfield, also start to happening because of what uh, Minister Fu mentioned on the collaboration and the effort of Singapore government together with Sing Power, Tamasek. Uh, we work together to create a new green uh, energy node as well, uh, like our retail center in Tampines. We work together to create uh, a more adaptive EV solutions to create it, um, the thinking on, on joining uh, with multiple developers to create district cooling on a brownfield uh, projects. So those are the, the change we want to continue to make. And many of those things drawn to an ambitious uh, scale of one Bangkok where it's built out of close to 20 million square feet on a single development planning that allow us to create uh, the, one of the largest district cooling uh, by uh, first by private sector and working together with a strong experience of Gulf Energy, Tokyo Gas and Mitsui. Uh, so we're able to provide the, the thinking on what the future real estate look like and how it could be future proof. But that's only a beginning of the stage where uh, from that then the design, the collaboration with the technology partners, uh, with user, with even the better insight that we, we work with Accenture to create a new thinking on customer journey. We work with Hitachi on creating the new smart cities thinking, how uh, with the single connected development of office, hotel, retail, residential, uh, we can see uh, in the trends of, of the city development, mixed use will become uh, the model that component need to be more connected. And that will build first thing on energy efficiency, it will build into a better circular economy, will working uh, on the entire supply chain as well, how we work from the build form. Uh, it's a great example at one Bangkok where uh, we're able to work with SCG, which is one of the largest cement company in Thailand, uh, to recycle the, the, the top uh, concrete pile that fully recycle because of the scale of the waste concrete just on a single built form, uh, able to build 30,000 uh, prefabricated panel, uh, 30,000 square meter prefabricated panel structure. Mm -hmm. So we are able to prove uh, the circular economy can be efficient, can reduce waste, and can build better efficiency to real estate as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, to scale of one Bangkok, we, we're coming live next year, and it will be an exciting stage to us looking from build form to operational form. And the important part is uh, understanding to build uh, the more sustainable customer journey and build efficiency together. Uh, we're creating uh, a full life cycle of sustainable and energy efficiency and looking at uh, part of the journey to renewable energy as well. The group has been focusing on uh, renewable energy, especially on solar. So we have now already installed about 25 megawatts of solar uh, system onto our real estate. And by next year, we'll complete to 35,000 uh, uh, 35, megawatts uh, of, of, of solar power. 
And, and Manish had talked about uh, digital. What are some of the exciting digital aspects of, of what you are doing there? Shindler have been a good part in building up this heart of, of the, the operating system. Uh, we operate the entire complex through data centers, through district cooling. So Schindler has been part of the main uh, electrical equipment uh, onto the facility as well. Uh, it's proof to, to give us the best insight and, and the knowledge in, in improving and developing uh, the right efficiency uh, to feed the right uh, um, energy into the life of one Bangkok, into 20 million square feet of operating real estate. Thank you. Thank you, Kunpa, both for giving us this opportunity. And we are, uh, you know, uh, the platform that you're using, which is EcoStructure, is something which can, uh, you know, there is one side is the CapEx and the other side is the OpEx. And I think that's, that that's when we are talking about uh, sustainability, we have to look across the full cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, here is a visionary and forward-looking company that is uh, already thinking uh, around it, and I'm sure that Bangkok Bank is uh, also looking at, you know, financing in terms of <laughs> this, this, how this. we can uh, look at the TOTEX, you know, the CAPEX plus OPEX uh, across the full cycle. This, this kind of entailing the, the, the decade of effort of us that uh, the, the policy maker and, and the financing part like Bangkok Bank as well has seen in us, and, and we have been working in a focus to, to drive the outcome of our sustainability initiative. And today, we already done over 10 billion of uh, green sustainably linked loans and bond. And uh, Bangkok Bank has been a great partner in, in the journey of all those initiatives with us as well. Uh, and, and thanks for the support. If, if I may say some words on his project, because I was shown the project at the point of the conceptual, conceptualization. I think because the chairman has a long vision, uh, but then put a very young leader in charge of the project. <laughs> so he brought in many uh, technology, and at that time also the expertise of Fraser Singapore also yes. put in quite significantly. So I could see at that time he, I was explained about how it's so not only commercial complex, uh, which normally we would see from a developer, but he also spent a lot of uh, emphasis on sustainability in different components and use different technology. So. Uh, to your point about acceleration, sometimes a leader can also help change that direction with the same investment, but then put in different emphasis. And I think we'll probably see the final product soon of how this will come out. Thank you, Kap. Chasri, Kap. And on, on the part of that objective, I, I would want to mention on how we become the, the first uh, lead neighborhood certification in platinum level as well. What we do here, it's the aim to support our partners, our customers as well, uh, where they are now, uh, if they are part of One Bangkok, they already get more than half of the certification point uh, to make themselves a fully sustainable uh, retail, sustainable uh, uh, real estate space as they plan as well. So our investment and future investment of what we think it's relevant to how we will be able to build and connect sustainable partners mm. to the future as well. Mm. As Kuntoni said, it, it, I think a lot of these complex systems solutions today require the, the wisdom of age, but also that, that young understanding of technology. And, and really, it's that, that mix of talents that need to be on these projects. Um, well, everyone is excited, the businesses and the residents, I'm sure, to, to move in next year. Uh, and now, if we shift gears to Anderson, you have such an extremely diversified uh, set of businesses. And that, that ranges from pulp and paper to palm oil to energy to real estate. What are the levers of decarbonization that you look at? And how do you prioritize them? Mark, again, thank you. Uh, Kuntoni, Panot, Manish. Uh, what's, what's fascinating just now is you say the two levers is electrification and digitalization. But uh, you got to bring that value chain just one step above. Because if that electricity that you're using is coming from fossil-based energy generation, yeah, it's, not. it's pointless. You can be EV, but you're using electricity that's actually generated from coal. Um, so I think if you take one step back, energy generation, basically sustainability needs to be done as a whole supply chain, uh, upstream all the way to consumers. And I think that's the exciting part and the biggest challenge for us. How do we connect the supply chain? 
For us, uh, we're more on the upstream side. That's from energy generation, which is uh, from the gas business, but also from biofuels. Um, for me, the exciting part about, about the transition right now is that going green actually makes business sense. A perfect example, um, solar panels. Uh, we've also decarbonized a lot of our operations from fossil-based uh, fossil energy to, to solar panel-based energy. In 2019, when I first installed my first megawatt of solar panels, the payback, as I shared a few years ago, was about 12, 13 years. Right now, with fossil fuel prices high, going to solar, the payback is less than six years. So right now, going green is not about only going green. It's great for business. That's the first. Second, if you want to decarbonize our business, I look at it from two, two value chains. One is feedstock. Are we sourcing sustainably? Are we sourcing the right materials? Second is how are we fueling or energizing our process industries? Um, and that is, for us, in our case, we're about 90% of our energy sources from biomass, but the last 10% is still from fossil base, whether it's gas or coal. That's how we're trying to decarbonize it by going through solar and some level of digitization. Digitization allows us to gain more efficiency. But fundamentally, if we're still having from, I mean, energy sources from, from unsustainable sources, it's not going to solve the fundamental problem. And, and we heard a little bit earlier about electrification, and you mentioned that in the beginning. I think it was the UN Secretary General when the most recent report came out, talked about the need to electrify everything, everywhere, all at once, a phrase that we all know quite well at this point. Now, you, you mentioned fuels. In a net zero world, what is the role of fuels looking beyond uh, electrification? I think, I think electrification definitely makes sense for a number of things. I, I mean, I, I give a good example. We have an LNG facility that we're building right now in Western Canada, in British Columbia. Uh, compressors are effectively uh, large fridges that cools gas from ambient temperature to minus 160 Celsius. The compressor that we have, instead of going gas drive, which is very natural because the gas is right there, we're going with electric drive. So that allows us our emissions to be reduced ninefold. So our, our average emissions is 11% of a regular LNG facility. And then the remainder 11%, we're deciding to offset it with nature-based solutions or street projects over there. So that's a good example how electric, uh, electrification can reduce emissions. But it still doesn't 100%, to me, eliminate emissions. And hence, there's still a lot of opportunities for, for the conversations of setting in the right format. That's the first. Second, electrification doesn't always work, at least in the next 10, 20 years. Aviation is a good example uh, because of its weight and power to weight ratio. So I think if, um, I think there'll be a still a, maybe another 5, 10, 15, 20 years where you see planes flying on electric batteries because of its weight. So that's when biofuels come in. I think there's a lot of discussion about sustainable aviation fuel. Not only, I think Europe just launched the mandate, 2% uh, of SAF blending starting 2025 and 1% increase every single year up until 2030. Singapore's looking at that as well and many other countries is looking at that. So biofuels have a role to play because it's actually readily available. Of course, the big challenge of biofuels is food versus fuel, right? I mean, are, are we using corn, uh, edible oils to actually go into fueling machines? Um, and in an inflationary environment like this now, it's very, very sensitive. So we have to move towards next generation feedstock or, 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 or second generation feedstock of biofuels, which is recycled oil, which is agricultural waste. Uh, again, bringing the circular economy concept to make sure that we're decoupling uh, food versus fuel conversation. So what I like about biofuels is readily available, the technology is there, and you can immediately implement and decarbonize existing machines. Uh, even though, yes, they're internal combustion engines or turbine engines, but you, you're immediately solving this problem in the next 10 years. So that's the exciting part about biofuels. Readily available feedstock, readily available machines. To convince the airlines, Boeings and Airbus, to switch to electricity in the next 10 years, that's going to be a stretch. I don't think we'll be on that airplane, but at some point we'll, we'll be on one of those. We'll see. Now, if we go back to you, Kuntoni, you know, we talked about capital, and naturally that is collaboration. You're providing capital into your customers and into the market. What are some of the other ways that you're influencing or, or supporting your customers? Uh, yes, you have asked us early about how Thailand started with the renewable energy and certain uh, incentive provided in order to get the business moving. Uh, energy is the largest uh, carbon emission 
I think next is the logistics. And in Thailand, I think they also try to convert and not have the adoption of the electric vehicle, the EV. So the last, the next year, promoting the adoption of the use that purpose. Uh, and I think the important part is in order to get the volume up so that the manufacturers can uh, do the assembly uh, in Thailand, as well as uh, to build other related part components in order to make the business uh, possible. So yes, uh, on one hand, to go for sustainability, economics is also an important factor, and certain incentive also is needed in order to keep, uh, in order to make it possible, and also then we'll be able to survive in the medium to longer term. Actually, on uh, Anderson's point on the biofuel, for example, in Thailand, the usage of the agricultural products to feel related also help farmers to be able to stabilize the uh, price of the food uh, of, of their products, which is also good for them uh, for the long-term uh, purpose and also so that they subject less to the volatility of the agricultural because industrial products sometimes price are more stable. It's such an important point in terms of the S of ESG and really the inclusive nature mm -hmm. that we need to have in this energy transition is, is farmers and other groups that mm -hmm. may not be part of that technical solution but actually can play a role, things like feedstocks and the way this can be circular as Anderson and Kumpano talked about as well. Um, Manish, you talked, you were, you were saying some really fascinating things separately earlier about how you influence your suppliers and tell us about that collaboration and how do you bring the whole ecosystem along? Sure. You know, uh, you know, sustainability is about achieving together and uh, it's something that uh, we have to embark the whole ecosystem and for us, uh, you know, uh, we have to also think upstream, I think taking Anderson's point, uh, and this is about how we are able to work with our suppliers. So if we, have, if we are committed to net zero by 2050, we need to make sure that our suppliers as well are embarking on that journey. So we have launched what we call as a zero carbon project where we have taken our top 1,000 suppliers. Uh, actually, a quarter of them are here in, in this region. Uh, and we want to get them uh, on a path of uh, reducing 50% of their carbon intensity by 2025. So it's a, it's a much more ambitious program because it's uh, taking the top 1,000. So we have created a playbook for decarbonization for them. Uh, we are using uh, what we use for, for our customers, for our suppliers, just as we use it for ourselves in our, in our facilities, uh, and get them uh, on this path, helping them get into renewables uh, and to see how they can be on this journey. Uh, today, pleased to see that uh, we are almost at about 18% in terms of the journey, and we started this program in 2021. So, you know, we are on the right path. We've also extended this program, working with some of our customers. So we have uh, Energize program, which is with the pharma industry, where we are helping their suppliers get on this. Uh, Gigaton is with, uh, with Walmart, uh, the same project for the Walmart. And recently, we did a Catalyze uh, program with uh, Intel and Applied Materials to see how we are able to take it into the semiconductor industry. So this, this, uh, this achieve together, that working together, uh, is something which is very, very important. And you know, we, are, we are pleased that we can share what we are doing ourselves uh, with our suppliers. Thank you. And, and Kun Panot, you mentioned collaboration earlier. And you've all talked about that, that ecosystem. But in terms of One Bangkok and really any of your projects, how do you identify the right partners who are with you in that agenda you have on sustainability, even when it may mean greater costs and you need to bring them along, you need to influence them? The beginning definitely have to be the vision first because of, you know, everybody can provide technology, provide expertise, but do they have the like-minded the alignment right, to sustainability? And it, it is the portion of, of uh, what we see that it's not a short journey, it's a, it's a continuous journey. Um, in, in our part, Fraser set out you know, as one of the first uh, real estate listing in Singapore Stock Exchange to set our uh, carbon neutral objective by 2050. And we set our science-based uh, target 
uh, the view of that is uh, it built into three stages. Uh, we built to, to get ourselves ready uh, to that target. But the stage of making sure we work with all our partners, all our tenants, all our customers, to making sure we all help to meet that target together is the most crucial part. So we start to want to making sure we engage uh, deeper in, in the vision and the outcome beyond the business as well. And, and once that's done right, it's actually what Anderson mentioned, it's become uh, even more viable because we are looking at the new efficiency. We are looking at the more sustainable outcome of our business. Mm -hmm. And end up all this part, as, as we look at this, of, of seeing in a broader base of what impact us as the world, as our society, our communities, that become the objective of the projects that we are doing. Uh, it's, it has to drive it people-centric. Mm -hmm. It has to drive it the smart thinking on smart cities, on smart real estate. But the third part is then, if you do that right, then the sustainability should be there. And sustainability beyond green is, is also the knowledge of the process uh, to get there. Right. And, and Anderson, similar question. Uh, when we think about the alignment you have to do upstream and downstream with your partners, even when economics may not suggest it, regulation may not require it, how do you, how do you work with those partners to, to drive and, and really accelerate your agenda? Mark, th thank you for the um, question. It's, it's fascinating. I always believe the saying, <laughs> it's an old African saying, to go fast, you go alone. To go far, you have to go together, right? Unfortunately, in this climate, uh, problem that we have, we have to go fast and you have to go far. So honestly, you, you take chances. Uh, we form collaborations with our upstream supply chain, uh, work, working very closely with our sourcing uh, team with, with the farms uh, to get them on RSPO certification. Some fail, some do not fail, but the reality is not doing anything is, is not the solution. So there are certain work streams, for example, like electrification, the LNG facility, we're working with Siemens, um, and uh, BC Hydro, which is the hydropower plant that supplies us electricity. So there's alignment of interest and collaboration come in. But there's certain collaborations that are actually almost misaligning of the interest, where, for example, we're pushing our truck suppliers to go towards electrification because we can provide cheap electricity at site, but there is still a resistance because internal combustion engine is still the dominant way of producing vehicles for trucks, especially for industrial use uh, in certain supply chains. So really, what we see right now is actually the companies with no burden, some of the Chinese truck companies are a bit more aggressive because they don't have the legacy supply chain of internal combustion engines. So my, my perspective on collaboration to push the sustainability conversation, because one of the topics here is leading with urgency, is form collaborations, multiple collaborations, some things you have to take risk, and you really see after a year or two, you will see whether the collaborations work or not and move forward, because not doing anything is definitely not the solution. So. I'd like to close the question. You know, you all are leaders of very distinct businesses, and you've talked about collaboration and technology. But for all of us in the room, as you look at the long horizons, what are we not talking about enough? What should be part of the conversation that you think is under our noses and we should be talking about more? Well, I, I, I would say that uh, let's do more of what is available today. Megawatt uh, is the best watt. So energy not consumed is the one that we don't need to produce. I think let's do more of that. Mm. Let's do more efficiency. Other thoughts? As we look at the long horizon, what should we be paying attention to? Other than GPT, we're all paying attention to <laughs> I think awareness is quite an important part. Uh, so how can we get uh, the people and the society to understand more what, 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 can, what is capable uh, of doing and also how to help the people make that transition. Uh, uh, I think uh, that is a very important part, which also means changes in the way that they do business on, and, they, on, and their, their daily life and how to make that transition possible to lead to greater and faster adoption. I, I view being in, in what uh, Anderson mentioned, I, I, I do like of, of us be able to make sure we're willing to take a bit of risk for the greater good and, and you know, 
moving ourselves uh, together with the right speed. Uh, it's, it's definitely uh, a good context that you have built. <laughs> Sorry to take away your answer. No, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep mine very short, Mark. Um, I, think, I think the reality is uh, as we transition, there are risks, but there are trade-offs. We just have to take some of these trade-offs. I mean, energy, for example, we talk about the energy trilemma. We would like low emissions energy, we would like secure energy, and we want low-cost energy. There are trade-offs, but we have to make decisions and move forward. Because if we are in the limbo, we want low-cost energy, we want low emissions energy, we want it secure, there's no perfect world out there. So we just have to make decisions, move forward, and certain trade-offs, we just have to bite the bullet and make decisions. So. These are not the leader, sorry, these are not the laggards that Minister Fu talked about earlier. Let's all accelerate. Let's all thank our summit advisors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.